Five Nights at Freddy's has a pretty unique spot in the indie game zeitgeist when it comes to fan-created content. I don't think that the sheer scale of the amount of fan content is even really comprehensible. Even just considering fan-made games, there are too many to count. However, amongst the tens of thousands of works of art, like Finding a Needle in a Haystack, there are a handful that have made their way towards becoming some of the most well-remembered and loved. This is what this video is about. On February 20th, I made a community post asking you all, the viewers, what the best of the best Five Nights at Freddy's fan games are. And from this list, I'd like to start a video series of retrospective discussions for some of the community's favorite fan games. And I figured for the first one, why not start from the beginning? Let's talk about Five Nights at Treasure Island, and how it triumphed from a more than half a decade long development nightmare to become one of the most well-loved and best made FNAF fan games to date. Our story begins not with Five Nights at Freddy's, but with a creepypasta. You see, the concept for Five Nights at Treasure Island is not just inspired by FNAF, but also by a 2013 creepypasta by the name of Abandoned by Disney, written by Slime Beast. Allow me to give a brief summary of the story. In the 1990s, Disney built two resorts that the locals were against, Treasure Island in the Bahamas and Mowgli's Palace in North Carolina. Despite sinking tens of millions of dollars into both projects, they were pretty quickly abandoned, for reasons unknown. The story chooses to focus on Mowgli's palace specifically, as the narrator of the story lives four hours from it, and decides to do some urban exploration after learning of Treasure Island through an internet blog he found. For some reason, he can't seem to find any information related to Mowgli's online though, almost like Disney has redacted all of it. He goes anyway, and brings his camera with him. It's essentially what you would expect from an abandoned Disney resort that's been desolate for years. However, there are some strange things to note. The bathrooms still have running water. He hears voices while exploring the guest rooms, and just assumes it's his imagination, the wind, or some random drug addicts. But as the sun begins to set, he visits the courtyard, which is a large 80-foot python statue. He thinks it's really cool, so he decides to take a picture of it. However, as he goes to do this, the snake stares into his eyes and then slithers away in the jungle around him. Somehow this, on top of the other weird occurrences, doesn't cause him to immediately leave the place, and he decides to go back inside the building. From there, he decides to explore an employee office, which seems previously unexplored since the door was pretty difficult for him to get open. And another weird thing happens, as the lights actually turn on in this room. He then accesses another door within this room to snap some pictures of the old, decaying costumes. In the center of the room is a photo-negative Mickey Mouse suit. The colors are inverted. Black is white, and white is black, and red is blue. He goes to take the head off of a different Donald suit, and a skull falls out of the bottom as he dislodges the head from the suit and comes crashing to the ground. As he tries to make his escape, the photo-negative Mickey suit begins to slowly rise, first sitting up and then standing up entirely until it's on its feet, and asks him in a perfectly replicated Mickey voice, Hey, you want to see my head come off? The narrator then freaks out and runs for the door. He escapes and hears the sound of flesh tearing and blood dripping behind him as, allegedly, the suit does take his head off. He never took the pictures that he wanted and never got to write his own blog about Mowgli's. He now realizes why Disney redacted all information on Mowgli's palace in the first place. A few years later, following the release and immediate explosive success of the first Five Nights at Freddy's game, Ann Art 1996, who I'll refer to as Matthew from now on, had an idea. He decided that he'd make a fan game. That creepypasta combined with Five Nights at Freddy's would serve as the basis for the game's story and mechanics. 
Unlike with the oversaturation that we see today, FNAF fan games essentially didn't exist in any form at this time, though it technically wasn't quite the first Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. It may as well have been. Regardless, he got to work. On November 3rd, 2014, he announced the game's development on his DeviantArt by posting the first teasers of the game. He showed off a model of photonegative Mickey as well as the Donald head and a map layout. Aside from these characteristics and the game taking place at Treasure Island, which wasn't even the focus of the original creepypasta, no other details really would be recycled from the root story. About a month passes, and at the tail end of November on the 30th, he posts another teaser with the words coming soon. And when he said soon, he meant soon, because two days later, he'd released the first demo for Five Nights at Treasure Island on December 1st. A few days after that, he updated the demo to include two nights, a more aggressive main antagonist, and some minor bug fixes. What happened next, he couldn't have possibly expected though, because this is when the game fell into the hands of large YouTubers such as Markiplier. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier and welcome to Five Nights at Treasure Island, the first, or at least first that I know of, fan game of Five Nights at Freddy's. Hey buddy, it's Greg here. Hi Greg. Hey, then you've probably heard of the photo-negative Mickey costume no, that wanders that? around. No. Oh, wouldn't want to screw up Greg's equipment now, would we? Oh, this lovely place where dreams come true. I kind of wanted to talk to him. <laughs> what the fuck? Being that FNAF was currently in the process of exploding following the first game's release and newly released second game, fans were desperate for any possible content that they could get, and this was it. The game's gameplay was pretty basic. You played as Jake, an intern for the Supernatural Studies Association, or SSA. You get a phone call from Greg who tells you about the suit and that it can only hear and not see. By turning off the cameras, you'd play a noise lure in another room that would distract it and make it leave, and the rest was standard for FNAF games. On the second night, you'd get a call from Lisa, who would clarify that photonegative Mickey can see, just not very well. However, this doesn't really impact the gameplay at all so it's fine. She also tells you about an unfinished Oswald suit, Oswald being a character Disney made before Mickey who ultimately ended up taking a back seat to him. There's also a Donald Duck head that occasionally sits on your desk and just makes a really obnoxious loud noise. Go away! Asshole! The game's popularity would soar. As proof of that today, Markiplier's video from 8 years ago sits at over 9.1 million views, with his part 2 at 4.3 million. Can you even visualize that number? That's crazy. That's like higher than the total population of a lot of countries. Unfortunately, this wasn't as cut and dry as it might seem for Matthew. He was actually pretty unsatisfied with the state of the game. He didn't expect it to get so popular so quickly, and he said that he couldn't keep up with the work and would need more time to complete slash polish it. About a month and a half later, on January 11th, Matthew would release a short teaser game in the meantime, in the form of The Button Machine Holds Codes. By pressing buttons to input the codes, you could receive some teasers, behind the scenes looks, and other similar things. That's basically all this has to offer. And two weeks later, on January 26th, he'd release the remastered demo or version 1.0. Unfortunately, this version of the game was actually quite unstable, which may be because it was completely rebuilt from scratch. And on February 1st, Matthew would release another teaser game called This Gives Some Extra Enlightenment, or TGSEE. It is very similar to the previous teaser game, as upon performing the required puzzle-like actions, you'd be treated to a bunch of 3D renders. Fast forwarding a few months, a trailer for the game would be released on Purity Center's channel on April 1st.
And on June 23rd, versions 2.0 and 3.0 were both released, for reasons I'll get into in a moment. Version 2.0 was a pretty big step up from 1.0 for Matthew, as all the cameras and locations were remade. A new camera for the roof was added, and a power mechanic was also added. With 3.0, the development starts getting a little complicated. According to Matthew, Purity Centers kept adding to the storyline until she had made a story which was completely different from what he had originally envisioned for the game. So he lost interest in the game and just gave all of the assets to her and her team. The ownership of the series was transferred over to her as well, and photonegative Mickey was replaced by Willie, the new main antagonist in version 3.0. A lot of other plans were put in place around this time, many of which wouldn't really go anywhere. This was the version of the game that existed for over a year. After the game files had been leaked due to a rogue developer, a drama between Slime Beast, the original creepypasta author and purity centers, and after a few conflicts between the team and the community, Matthew announced the game would just be cancelled on June 23rd, 2015. She would later claim that she was going to take over the project entirely with a trilogy of new games called Project DI that month, but it was cancelled just two months later, in August. Later the next year, in 2016, Matthew would post the game files publicly so that any developers could take the original concepts and make fan-made continuations of Five Nights at Treasure Island. This began the period of fan games from 2016 to 2018. In September of 2016, about 14 months after the release of 2.0 and 3.0, 4.0 was announced. Developers Subwoofer X3 and Blackout 1912 collaborated to make a fan game for Five Nights at Treasure Island, called Nightmare Before Disney, which borrowed ideas from Five Nights at Freddy's 4 and incorporated it into this universe. The idea for this game went all the way back to mid-2015, but that version was cancelled. The gameplay for the game sort of went like this. You're trapped in a nightmare fighting against evil tunes, which is what the monsters or whatever the suits are called. And to drive them off, you must blink and sometimes use the monitors, which have 10 cameras. You also have pills to alleviate your rising heart rate, and it has 10 nights instead of the general 6 or 7 from most FNAF style games. And a few months later, in January of 2017, the same two developers collaborated once more to make a definitive, quote unquote, final version of the game. Five Nights at Treasure Island 4.0. The main storyline from 3.0 was maintained. The main menu was changed, the old characters were entirely reworked, new locations were added, a final boss was added, and more controversially, Photonegative Mickey and Willy were entirely replaced by a new character named Mick Mick. This was a very poorly received change, and among other reasons, caused version 4.0 to be cancelled before it was finished. Funnily enough, this team actually also put together a teaser game similar to the old ones from the original developer Matthew. It was called Five Nights at Treasure Island TBMSTF, and the acronym is still not known to this day. It worked almost exactly the same as the original one, having five buttons and revealing teasers when certain inputs were made. If we skip all the way to October 28th, Matthew would actually upload a new fully redesigned alpha build of Five Nights at Treasure Island being nicknamed version 5.0. The visual style of the game had changed entirely, but the gameplay was more or less the same. Unfortunately, due to natural limitations caused by the game being developed in Game Maker, Matthew would have to abandon this version of the project as well. Blackout from version 4.0 and another developer, PNM, tried several times to revive version 4, calling it version 4.5 and even releasing Five Nights at Treasure Island 2017 in December. Even though it happens many years later, I think it is worth noting that Malrat did later try to reboot Treasure Island 2017, but only a demo came out and the full game seems to be in limbo to this day. A new team would rise to the occasion to bring Five Nights at Treasure Island the treatment it had always truly deserved. 
allow me to introduce to you Team Radiance. The year before all this happened, in 2016, three developers, Nocturnum, Lillian, and Peyton, would found a development team named Unicorn Games. They were approached by another development team named Dark Secrets Games with a proposition for merging, and they accepted. Though Dark Secrets Games would go defunct in 2017, the rest of the team would go on to become a standalone dev team known as Radiance. They would be the saviors of Five Nights at Treasure Island. Originally, they seemed to have already had a fan game nicknamed Treasure Island 2016 to 2018 with little surviving information related to it. The game used the camera system from version 2.0 minus Cam 11. This game would have featured photonegative Mickey, Oswald, Disembodied, Acephalus and his head, photonegative Minnie, Pluto, Hortensia, Daisy, Slester, Hourglass, Undying, and God. Yeah, it's a, it, it got a little complicated in the few years of fan games. Basically, almost every character that was introduced over the years. This game also would have had four main gameplay mechanics instead of just shutting off the camera and playing a noise. You'd also be able to hide under the desk, shut off the power, and stand still. This game was cancelled, but Radiance was far from finished. In 2018, Nocturnum asked Blackout for permission to develop a new game. He obliged, and later he also received permission from Slime Beast, the author of the Creepypasta, and Matthew, the original developer. Thus, the development for Treasure Island could officially be underway, being announced via Games Old Post in April of 2019. Then, the first trailer for Radiance's new version of the game, version 6.0, came out. And by the looks of the trailer, this was set to be the best version of the game the community had ever received. A few months later, in November, the second trailer dropped along with the full game. Now we've finally received Treasure Island 2020. You have one unheard message. Hello, Jake. Hey there, this is Greg from the Supernatural Studies Association. I'm just leaving you a message to notify you that we have a position open that you might be interested in. A small one, but hey, it's intriguing nonetheless. Currently, my team is doing an investigation over at this abandoned island. You might be familiar with it. The locals refer to it as Treasure Island. We just need someone to look over the place for a few days and collect data for us while we get things ready over at base. Should be a simple task. An easy way to get credits too. Hopefully you're interested. Give me a call back as soon as possible. Bye. The gameplay and story derived from the very first version, with you playing as the same character Jake and receiving updated but similar versions of the same phone calls from the same people. The game starts with a missed phone call from Greg at the Supernatural Studies Association referring to an open internship position to investigate the titular Treasure Island. And from there, the story continues from how we know it. Greg calls you on night one and Lisa on night two. The mechanic to turn off the cameras and play a noise to distract returns, but the mechanics to turn off the lights and stand perfectly still are added, which were concepts from their previously cancelled game. And each suit needs a specific one of these mechanics used against them in order for you to survive. The cast of characters sees mostly familiar faces return. On night 3, you get a call from another SSA intern who seems to be trapped in the pirate caverns. Is hearing this. My name is Henry. I, I don't 
have much time. I'm one of the SSA's interns. I'm stuck in pirate caverns. Please, whoever finds this message, help me. I, I know a lot of things about this place. I can't say it all over the phone. They could be listening. Just please come get me out of here. I'm on the second floor. After the end of the night, you transition into a point and click adventure type segment and the gameplay completely changes. Surprisingly, this is a welcome change because the horror in this section is really well executed. You have to avoid the face, who I talked about just a bit ago, and find a door key, ride down the elevator, and then you get to meet this new fella. His name is Undying, by the way. Then you're treated to a secret room with doodles pasted all over the wall and giant text that seems written in blood. Before you even have time to process what's going on, Night 4 begins. Undying from the Caverns makes his gameplay debut. Aside from that, everything stays the same as it was before, just with another tune to contend with. Night 5 is also like this, just a little harder. And then after completing Night 5, a cutscene plays. Message. Hey Jake, I'm a little late to notify you about this. My apologies. I'm just leaving you a message to let you know that we're gonna need more time. I know you probably want to get out of there, but there's been a few issues over here at base, and you're gonna have to stay at the island for a little bit longer. I'm super sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. Just try and keep everything stable, and you'll be completely fine. I'm sure of it. I'll notify you when we're ready to pick you up as soon as possible. Thanks, and good night. At the beginning of the night, you get another call from the other intern who says he figured out the passcode to the door that leads to the third floor of the building. Before you have time to process the implications of that, however, you're met with an abomination. And this is where Treasure Island takes the unorthodox approach of combining all of the tunes into one mess of a monster nicknamed Hourglass. Because he's a combination of the other tunes, he actually has all of their attack patterns combined into one making for a fantastically crafted showdown against a true final boss on the last night. Once you complete this night, you naturally head towards the third floor, open the door with the code that you were given, and are welcomed to a vault. I failed to mention this before, but between every night, there were cutscenes that depicted this shadowy Mickey figure with white hollow eyes and her name is Mother. At the end of the third floor cutscene, she appears once more. The room fades to black, and the game ends and the credits roll. This game also has a lot of other homages to famous Disney creepypastas and earlier versions of the Treasure Island games. For example, it is possible on earlier nights to find a character named Mortimer, who is a reference to Suicide Mouse.avi, a creepypasta that inspired the entire Lost Episode genre to begin with marketing itself as a lost 1930s Mickey Mouse cartoon paired with some haunting imagery and sounds. There's also lots of references to other Disney stuff and older games, as it's possible in the custom night to see the original Steamboat Willie, who was used in 3.0 if you remember, and Pete from the original Steamboat Willie cartoon. It is also possible to see Pluto off to the left in the dark corner of the office, though he doesn't really do anything. The last excellent homage is the addition of a classic mode, which allows you to play the previously never finished original version of Five Nights at Treasure Island. For one small note before we move on to the next section, I figured I'd mention Five Nights at Treasure Island Anniversary Edition. This is a separate Team Radiance project that remade the original version 1.0 demo with improved graphics and polish. It was actually finished before 6.0 or Treasure Island 2020, but they decided to delay it so as to not overshadow their bigger project, which had the unfortunate downside of delaying the release past the anniversary. It seems that this game truly has finally triumphed over its nearly six year development hell. but. Was Radiance done? No, not yet. 
Today is December 1st, 2004. This is Dr. Jared Rowley speaking, and my patient's name is Jake Smith. As per authoritative requests, all sessions with Mr. Smith from this point forward will be recorded for use in the Discovery Island case. Now, Jake, before we get started, I'm going to briefly explain the circumstances behind your admittance here on tape for the sake of documentation. Is that okay? Okay. Jake Smith was declared missing in 2003 during the Discovery Island incident. A year later, on July 23, 2004, he was found and taken into custody after displaying signs of delusions and paranoia. Currently, he's a suspect in the disappearance of Greg McLaughlin, Lisa Birch, and Henry Miller. Now, Jake, can you tell me anything you recall from your time on Discovery Island? We spoke about it a little during our first session, but I've been asked to get a statement on tape. Maybe you'd like to start from the beginning and work your way from there? About your time as an intern? No? That's... that's all right, Jake. We can do that again whenever you're comfortable. Maybe... maybe you'd like to talk about what exactly caused you to vanish like that, or where you were when you were missing. I know you said it was a blur, but maybe trying to talk about it will help you remember. Okay, that's, that's also fine. What about the cabin? Can you tell me about the cabin, Jake? You told me that nothing happened there during our last session, but considering what you did to the place... Look, this case has stumped the authorities, Disney, even the agency you worked for. There's just dead end after dead end, and your friends' families have no answers. We know something happened in that cabin. If you don't want to talk about it right now, that's okay too. But please, I think getting it off your chest at some point would really benefit you. The sooner they get answers, the sooner we can focus on helping you get better. Don't you want to put all this behind you, Jake? You spent a year on that island. You lost a year of your life to it. Three friends. Do you really want it to take even more? Thank you, Jake. Now please, tell me about the cabin. On November 28, 2022, Radiance released Obelidus Casa, the official sequel to Treasure Island 2020. Though it is a sequel, it also updated and retconned a lot of the story from the previous game. Nocturnum himself even said that any inconsistencies simply render the first game not canon. However, many other things have been kept, such as the characters and basic timeline of events. The story takes place one year following the events of Treasure Island. The opening cutscene depicts a conversation between the previous protagonist, Jake, and probably his therapist or doctor. On night one, we're introduced to the game's beautifully made setting, a cabin. A notepad at your disposal serves as your tutorial and guide. On this night, you only have to deal with Willy and Belial. With Willy, you use a music lore to move him to different cameras, and with Belial, he slowly begins to show up on your notepad, and you just have to erase him. And I have to say that this is honestly one of the coolest mechanics I've ever seen in any FNAF fan game, even though functionally it's basically just a music box. To shout some more praises, I think the environments look even better in this game than they did in Treasure Island 2020, and that's really saying something, because those were already fantastic. The lighting, atmosphere, models, and animations have just taken that extra step in this game. It honestly looks like its own independent game. They're ridiculously well polished for something that essentially boils down to a fan project for an existing franchise. Another interesting idea reveals itself if you happen to die. You see, this game actually allows you a second chance. You're put into a setting that could honestly be an entire other game of its own, and your goal is to find three hidden Mickeys to clear the game whilst fending yourself off using more unique mechanics. The game actually includes a scripted death on Night 1 from Mother from the previous game in order to introduce it to the mechanic. This is all fine and good by itself, but the developers went an even further extra mile to add a new gameplay section between nights. These are the tunnels. In the tunnel portion of the game, you navigate a series of tunnels while attempting to find an exit, however, Hourglass from the previous game is lurking in the area. The map consists of a 7x7 grid of 49 rooms, only one of which contains the exit. Since this would obviously be very difficult to find normally, the game has a mechanic that plays a bell in the direction you're intended to go in. 
hence the compass in the corner. But be careful, Hourglass might just find you. On night two, we get introduced to three more tunes, Daisy, Pete, and Face. Daisy isn't actually too bad. You need to avoid her in the cameras or flash the light. Otherwise, she'll show up in your office and be a nuisance. She's also capable of temporarily disabling the camera she appeared on. Face, on the other hand, is much more important to the gameplay loop. Occasionally, you'll hear a sound from the attic, and in that case, you need to go up there and shine your lighter at him. However, if Pete shows up, you need to leave, otherwise it's game over. Knights 3 and 4 only introduce one new threat each. This makes sense, as the cast of antagonists is already pretty large. This serves to balance the difficulty curve, which would normally be sharpest in games like this on these two nights. On night 3, you get introduced to Photonegative Mini, who can easily be deterred by the camera flash if she gets closer to you. And on night 4, you become acquainted with Dippy. He tries to get into your office by breaking the window to your left, but he's also not too difficult to deal with. After night 4 is completed, you're treated to this cutscene. They didn't even understand what you wanted. They were scared. And you killed them. You people shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have led you. I've seen what you people do here. something they can't understand. Every time they push and prod and pull too deep, you don't even realize that the grass you step on, the air you breathe, it's all me. I've always been here. Single time. Even if you didn't realize it. Even if you didn't recognize me. I have been here forever. And I will be here forever. But even after countless amount of times I've seen this play out. The eternities I've spent with you. I never thought you'd go this far. I was wrong to let you pollute this place. To walk all over me as long as I did. Strong not to deal with you long, long time ago. It will all end here. I will make sure of it. Mother, infuriated at the death of Hourglass by your hand, becomes the primary antagonist for Night 5. Unlike Nights 1 through 4, this one does not treat you to a second chance minigame. You must survive. Similarly to Hourglass in the previous game, 
Mother takes on the characteristics of the other tunes from earlier nights. When Mother is shown with pupils, the flash must be used, however, when they are absent, the audio lore must be used. The notepad also has Mother's face constantly coming into existence, and you must erase that too. For some reason, face is still present in this night. Apparently, it's the only character not under her direct control. Although this time, you have to flash him with the lighter at least six or seven times, maybe even up to nine times, to really get rid of him. This night, all things considered, is not that bad. At least, not until 3 a.m. This is when Mother transforms into an even more grotesque version of herself, and becomes exponentially more aggressive, and the margin of error plummets. However, if you manage to triumph over her, the sun rises. And this is likely the sequence of traumatic events that circles back to Jake's therapy session at the beginning of the game. It all comes full circle. The final amazing detail from Oblitas Casa that I'd like to talk about is these custom challenges. As a tribute to the popular creepypastas that may have inspired the original story abandoned by Disney, you can play against Jeff the Killer, Slenderman, Smile Dog, or Eyeless Jack. 
Now, no game is without its flaws, Oblitus Casa included. After all, Team Radiance is not a company, it's just a group of people having fun making games. However, they still do their best and they really, really care about their projects, and as evidence of that, they're currently working on Oblitus Casa 2.0, with the goal of making the game even better than it already is. Five Nights at Treasure Island is most certainly one of the most iconic FNAF fan games of all time. The fact that even as recently as just a few months ago, as of the writing of this video, that it can still have such an impact on the community at large and help set a new bar for fan game quality along with titans such as FNAF Plus in the near future, just goes to show that even in 2023, the Five Nights at Freddy's community stands strong and proud. I am so glad that Treasure Island never died, and hopefully you all feel the same. Tell me in the comments which fan game or fan game series you want to hear me talk about next, although I already have a few ideas. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed, and that's going to be all from me. Until next time.